Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon to all who have joined the, the webinar organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association. I'm Dr. Padma Gunratna, the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. This uh, particular webinar we have organized in collaboration with the College of Radiologists, and it would be on radiology update, CT imaging in cardiovascular disease. So as you know that there are many advancements in the field of radiology, and I particularly know of the advancements that have happened in neuroradiology, which have made so much changes and advances in managing cerebrovascular diseases. So, uh, I mean, in par with that, definitely there has to be so many advances that has happened in cardiovascular disease as well. So it's extremely important that we be up to date on these recent advances. And based on that, we have organized this uh, particular webinar on radiology update, CT imaging in cardiovascular disease. There are three uh, eminent speakers to address this the topics in relation to this. Imaging of coronary arteries will be addressed by Dr. Devinder Karnaratna, consultant cardiothoracic ra thoracic radiologist, Manchester University Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. And then cardiac CT in acute chest pain will be addressed by Dr. Buddhi Abhivikrama, consultant interventional radiologist at Sri Jawadhanapura Hospital. The program will be moderated by Dr. Janaka Rajapaksha, consultant radiologist, at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. So while thanking all of you for joining the webinar organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association, let me invite Dr. Janaka Rajapaksha to uh, commence the, uh, uh, the webinar uh, and to continue with the proceedings. Over to you, Janaka. Thank you, Madam. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, on behalf of the College of Radiology um, for organizing this event, um, in fact, it's warm welcome to all of the attendees uh, and the resource persons. There are two uh, lectures lined up, and we know that the cardiac imaging uh, has uh, revolutionized in the recent past. CT coronary angiography has been a, an invaluable investigation, and we had some difficulty in the past due to unavailability of uh, the in infrastructure. Now, of course, uh, uh, with the vision of the College of Radiology and with the uh, Ministry of Health, we have in installed a new CT machines with capable of cardiac imaging in the Department of Radiology in, uh, in some of the government hospitals. There are many radiologists who have received training in cardiac imaging, especially in CT and MRI. Uh, and of course, our Postgraduate trainees also undergo training in cardiac imaging, and now it is part of their curriculum. So the most advanced 640 slide CT, spectral CT scanner uh, is available uh, at NHSL, and it is the most advanced machine in the country, as well as in the Southeast Asia. Uh, it is fast scanner with artificial intelligence based imaging quality uh, optimization. Mm -hmm. It is the only scanner uh, to perform coronary angiograms with a single beat. Mm -hmm. We have other CTs, machines capable of doing cardiac CTs installed at several uh, centers, for instance, Anuradhapura, Badulla. And at the same time, cardiac MRI has also been, uh, it is being performed at NHSL and several other teaching hospitals. NHSL also has the capability of per performing cardiac spec as well as spec. Um, uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, two important lectures lined up. And our first uh, uh, lecturer is Dr. Devinda Karnaratna. And it is, a, it is great pleasure for me to introduce him. Uh, his MBBS, MRCS, FRCR is a consultant cardiothoracic radiologist at Manchester University Hospital. NHS Foundation Trust is a lead at cardiothoracic imaging uh, department. He has qualified from the University of West Indies 
and obtained MRCS from Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh in 2005. And he had his FRCR fellowship in 2009 and completed his cardiothoracic fellowship in 2011 at Papavad, Cambridge. He has, he's involved in many research work and it includes ischemic trial, syntax two study, EVA trial and Calypso study. Uh, he's a frequent visitor to Sri Lanka and a good friend of the College of Radiology and has worked for the development of field of radiology in Sri Lanka and has trained many young radiologists uh, at, in, in UK. And over to you, uh, Dr. Devind. Thank you, Dr. Rajpaksha. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Gerard and the college for inviting me and the SLMC for hosting the college. I gather from Gerard, this is the first time the Sri Lankan college is going, uh, doing a webinar on SLMC. So um, before, because a lot of people are um, slightly unfamiliar with the cardiothoracic imaging, um, what I do in uh, UK, I just want to give you a little bit of a background. So the presentation will be few clinical cases give a background of where cardiothoracic imaging, particularly coronary CT, fits in the whole realm of the patient journey and paying attention to a little bit of more evidence, why we do and why what we do, and to concentrate on the importance of patient. So if you go to the hospital website where I work, that's the image they show, but actually I work in a very old part of the hospital, which is built in 1950s, hardly under developed, but there are good equipment inside it. So I would say I work at the heart of the whole hospital, even though it's a brand new hospital and I work at the old end. Um, there are no declarations from my part, but I just wanted to show uh, this slide just to show we I wear many hats um, over the last 12 years working at Manchester Foundation Trust. Um, both involved at a local level, regional level, and a national level. So uh, from a local point of view, I would say I've set up the cardiac CT and cardiac MR service at the MFT. There was a, a very infant a cardiac MR facility at a very early infancy set up by one of my predecessors, one of the vascular radiologists, but I took it on. After finishing my fellowship, we set up the CT and MR and leading the cardiac radiology part. And I partly um, teach at the University of Manchester for the imaging department who are mainly physicists and the very few medical students are involved in it. At a regional level, I'm involved in the, and the whole team in our department is involved in setting up how do we analyze the GM needs for cardiovascular um, imaging, how do we implement it and identify the structure and putting it through. And we also have in the region a uh, Northwest School of Radiology, and I lecture there at the college. Um, from a national level, we are partly involved with the implementation and research development part of the BS, British Society of Cardiovascular Imaging, British Society of Cardiac CT, and Cardiac MR and of course, RCR, which is the umbrella group. So we wear, I wear many hats in these small groups um, and I would like to share some of the experiences which is relevant to us when we set up the service. I think in Sri Lanka, you have this amazingly unique opportunity to set up the service with really good equipment. And I'm very envious of your new scanner at the NHL. Even I don't have such an up-to-date scanner at our trust. So to give a little bit of background of the European cardiovascular diseases, UK is performing really badly. This is just to show you 100,000 um, mortal, uh, mortality rates in the Europe and UK North West, particularly where I work in Manchester have really poor cardiovascular diseases. It's the second most common cause in UK, but Manchester and the Northwest are pretty bad when it comes to smoking, stroke, cardiac diseases and renal diseases. So um, I was called in with a group of other physicians in the region to set up a uh, what we call the 3-3 cardiac. So how do we match 
and deliver a, a tertiary care service to the people because the people and the patients are suffering. So we try to match the GP, the primary sector, and to harmonize and standardize our service because cardiovascular imaging when I first started was done only at very few spots and nowhere in the Northwest Explit Blackpool Hospital was doing cardiac imaging. Hence, I went to Cambridge to do my fellowship. So during the GM analysis, we identified few parts that we thought we might need to tackle when it comes to imaging, which is stable angina, acute chest pain, how do we manage, how do we um, implement best structure and how can radiology support in cardiovascular imaging and few elements of heart rhythm conditions. So in the analysis, we've identified these three key points, stable chest pain pathway development, how do we implement it, acute chest pain pathway development, arrhythmia. And the last point I've highlighted is the key, the workforce and how do we deliver a service over seven days. So this is an example of the team that I work with. Um, we don't have this perfect setup. However, we have some of the elements which is situated here to deliver a chest pain clinic, radiology collaboration with our uh, physicians, both the cardiologist and non-cardiology, which our main um, access of imaging would be our renal, um, general physicians and acute physicians all together involved. So radiographers, radiologists, clinicians, pharmacists, this is the team that I've described in this slide top panel, which is absolutely important because retaining a workforce is a key. Otherwise, you'll be wasting a lot of time training your juniors and not actually achieving much in order to deliver a good service for the patients. So one of the key enablers for us over the last 12 years was um, um, identifying and engaging with clinicians and the patients to see what we could offer from iron, what can they reach out, appropriate referrals is a key. And the other key point is gatekeeping, who gatekeeps all these referrals. And the other big point to identify standardizing reporting, standardizing quality, and particularly when you start a service, it needs to be done at few spots, few identified locations to improve quality. So another piece of work that we were involved in, are we okay to deliver this service at each hospital or should we identify few sites which might have the expertise to offer it. So at our hospital local, we are very fortunate. It's the largest NHS hospital bed trust like the NHSL, the whole of UK. Now, because we merged with two hospitals now, we have both CT, huge nuclear medicine department, which takes a lot of our cardiovascular workload. And we also have cardiac MR. And we are very fortunate, superb echocardiogram department and a good working relationship between the clinicians and us radiologists. So the, our priority is this, how do we manage referral because the workload is growing up? How do we improve the patient experience? And the third point is quality, 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 because we need to maintain standards in our reporting and because the clinicians have to trust what we say at the end of it and then um, implement what we are saying onto the person. And the last point is the workforce. Because the NHS, like here, um, we are training all the juniors, including the radiographers, but it's very difficult sometimes to retain them in the government sector because they go into the private sector for full-time working. I don't know whether that's a common problem here. But just to say, these are referrals. Most of our cases come from outpatient cardiology, but the other people who refer to us is the respiratory, renal, acute physicians, and we get referrals from, Buddh is gonna talk about from acute chest pain pathway. We do get referral from a &E and acute ambulatory unit, which are those intermediary sites where patients are not admitted to the hospital, but they might stay in um, acute setting for 12 to 14 hours, depending on whether they could get in imaging and be discharged. And the other group we get is all CICU, post-cat lab, 
and all in patient wards. We have a huge um, a congenital heart disease uh, um, cohort in our trust, and um, we do a lot of imaging for the team. So when we talk about the scope of cardiac CT or gated CT, I would like to call because coronary artery disease is one element. Yes, of course, it involves large part of our caseload. Um, our cases come from rapid access chest pain clinic, which is our patient. Within a seven day period, we try to turn around referrals, but of course the scanning will take much longer. Um, and of course we have the graph setting, which is post coronary artery bypass graft imaging and all other coronary artery disease, which are stable, but the history of ischemic heart disease. CT have its limitations in offering the third category. The other group, big group, which we're getting a lot of popularity is um, pre-cardiac interventional planning. CT is done to, um, as a, almost like getting a chest radiograph, we do tend to do gated CT on a lot of pre-cardiac surgical planning. For an example, TAVI, which is transcatheter venous, aortic valve implantation, mitral valve implantation, post-ablation, all of these gaining popularity. But the TAVI planning CT is probably our largest referral pathway, which takes to about 60% of our non-coronary artery disease assessment. ACHD, when I first started, ACHD was a really big team. Unfortunately, we lost two surgeons. So some of the service has moved to Liverpool rather than Manchester. But we still have a lot of outpatient scanning to be done on congenital heart disease. The other group I would like to concentrate on iotopathy. Um, I share some of the workload with the vascular interventional radiologist who does some of the reporting for iotic work, which is all these things highlighted in yellow are shared by uh, vascular interventional colleagues. They don't necessarily have to be cardiothoracic radiologists to report them. And we do a tertiary referral for query dissection imaging as well. And I think we will talk about the concept of double rule out and triple rule out, which have a lot of evidence because uh, discharge from a &E or the acute setting is gaining a lot of popularity without much time waiting for imaging. And because of our close collaboration with the University of Manchester, of course, we are a primary sites for most of the research development as well. I share some workload, which is highlighted in pale blue with some of my thoracic colleagues. When I first started job, my job was 50-50, but I hardly do any thoracic reporting anymore because over 90% of my work involves cardiac only. And I just attend the lung MDT um, on a rota basis. So this is just to point out our activity. The cardiac gated work has gone year on year. It's a 68.5% increase. This is increase. It's impossible to meet even with, we have over five scanners to deal with. We still struggle to cope up with the work. So I would say we have two scans earmarked for to come on live in the next four to five years. But I would like to say this is both an opportunity and there are some limitations. I think table time and the expertise with the allied staff, which is the radiographers, the nursing staff, and the whole team is one of our limitations. So I think if you do in a model of cluster based, bring the expertise together, that's where we worked. So we are delivering, we have 14 trusts in the region. So we deliver cardiovascular imaging at four sites we try to amalgamate by bringing a larger focus, collaborative work, and we'll be able to ma manage quality. Uh, as you know, um, without paying much attention to outcomes um, and the value base of imaging dwindles. So it's very important to maintain clinical governance and overall patient satisfaction is a key. So I think I had the good fortune of meeting Mr. Michael Porter, who always used to say that uh, without paying much attention to the outcomes, uh, paying attention to cost would dwindle the value. So, and the other big piece of work which we've done is to harmonize imaging of query dissection pathways, because we tend to do a lot of scanning for query dissection, whether it's a question which is considered whether it's a PE 
or it's a dissection or coronary artery disease, they don't know. So we try to harmonize and follow the BACI guidelines and the RCI guidelines and created this high risk conditions and um, amalgamate to identify biotic dissection, intramural hematoma and penetrating ulcer pathway to a really nice setup. So that's my regional contribution overall. And the other big piece of work which we've done is to do a gap analysis to identify what equipment do we have and can the departments and the hospitals actually deal with the workload. So this would be my summary document just to say overall we've talked about there are a lot of anxieties from some specialities whether we are de-skilling a workforce by trying to harmonize the uh, delivery of service but overall it has been a very positive experience by cluster-based delivery of imaging because it, the quality is need to be maintained. Um, I know I've heard there is some interest in uh, GM-based, uh, Colombo-based collaboration of imaging. That's probably, you will meet some uh, benefit, um, but overall my Manchester experience has been unavoidable without a collaborative work. But I would like to end this brief introduction of the background just to say that ultimately if we concentrate just on the illness of a patient we actually miss out that there is a patient with an illness i had the good fortune of meeting a very old trainee when i was a houseman who used to constantly say it's important to identify the patient with an illness and not an illness in a patient so that's it and the other thing i wanted to say when we first set up a cardiovascular service at our trust, there was a lot of debate who should be delivering it. This is just to uh, break down the delivery. In Canada, most of the cardiovascular services are run by radiologists. In USA, oh, less than uh, 15 to 12% um, is a collaboration and the rest are done by radiology departments. In UK, we have a, a we're very fortunate, we have a a 20 to 80 breakdown of imaging services, but we work together very well. So there is no single model of care, but I think the debate and discussion is important to deliver the service because the workload is uh, massive and it requires a lot of expertise. And ultimately, we need to highlight these points and not forget that rather than concentrate too much on symptom-based imaging, we need to identify probably um, symptom base within a patient. So let me go to why we are here. Um, this is the ground make, ground make breaking uh, guidelines which came in 2016. When I first started as a consultant, we followed the original guidelines based on NICE where the CT is offered into low risk group of patients, which is 10 to 29%. So what they do is they do the risk modeling, how likely they are to develop cardiovascular disease, and then offer whether the calcium score or CT coronary angio to the group, which is low risk. But in 2016, that guidelines completely changed based on the three symptoms, which is three elements, which are characteristics of chest pain. So CTCA, which is the CT coronary, has gone right to the top of the agenda of decision making. So there may not be too much pretest probability, there may not be any functional imaging, but if you can offer a service with CT as the first line of investigation, that's what we want to achieve. Unfortunately, UK, even with so many equipment and workforce, we struggle to deliver this service, but CT is there at the top of the investigative tool. The evidence is unavoidable because CTCA is incredibly powerful at its sensitivity and also its negative predictive value. So if you, prior to CTCA getting this um, place, Non-functional imaging had a lot of priority. Over half of the patients had a non-invasive functional test and ended up having an elective angiogram and found to have no coronary artery disease. So the strength of CTCA is massive, but the, it's not without any criticism. There is a lot of criticism saying that CTCA picks up coronary artery lesions and so what? Do we need to do anything about it? 
actually, yes, some of the lesions which are dormant actually doesn't need any intervention. So there is a concept which is BMJ and the RSNE talks about vomit. So the, it's called vomit because there is an element of people who develop are victims of imaging. So the victims of medical imaging. So, but the criticism for CTCA is limited, but the strength of CTA is unavoidable because of its negative predictive value. Once we have a normal CT, we'll be able to discharge the patient back to the physicians or give a reassuringly cast iron guarantee for a, a period. There is a shelf life in patients we need to pay attention because if the patient's life lifestyle risks deteriorate, the disease progresses. So the evidence is invaluable and uh, the negative predictive value of CT in multiple meta-analysis, both in a stable angina, and there is some evidence even in an emergency setting, which is the ACS group, which Buddhi will be talking about, the negative predictive value is Big. The fact that we can't offer CT to all patients who are coming in the ACS group is because we don't have access to equipment. This, these are some of the summary documents. I think I would like, I don't mind sharing these. These are widely available online if one is in, interested in to know uh, what backs up why the CT has gone up to the top of the agenda. So we did a UK lab wide landscape analysis whether we could deliver a service and there is a 700% increase in the CT delivery and we are unable to meet. So this pathway we've developed at our tri uh, site with a consultant in acute medicine called Professor Rick Body, who have developed this ambulatory care pathway to meet some of the demands in the acute chest pain and to see whether we could either identify them as normal, mild, moderate, or severe stenosis. And based on all this, we'll be able to discharge the patient less than 12, 12 hours from admission. So most of the patients, over 80% of the CTs we do, tend to be having normal scans. So they can be easily discharged back to the community and they might have mild disease. Only caveat is if you have a moderate lesion, this might require another form of investigation, either a myo view or a stress or other form of functional imaging. So this is another work, piece of work just to say, um, there's a 6% of all ED presentations are due to chest pains so with a large cohort. So my first image, just to show you, this is a, a summary document by the Jeffrey Hounsville when he won uh, um, joint, um, um, Nobel Prize uh, for Physiology and Medicine. This image was one he produced, and he said in 1979, there is a future for cardiac CT in 1979. And two decades later, we are able to produce this imaging piece of work. This is a just to a summary, just to show you, this is the sort of work we'll be able to acquire by a, this is a dual source scanner showing the gantry rotation around the patient and be able to obtain a perfectly uh, good scanner with no motion artifacts and with contrast enhancement with, uh, with Professor Geoffrey Hounsville was talking about in 1979. Two years late, two decades later, we'll be able to offer this. So this is a prospective imaging, imaged at a certain time point in the diastolic phase of imaging. And just to highlight a little bit more, patient is fed through the scan and the gantry patient's table moves in with a static gantry with rotation, either it's a single source or dual source and concentrate on a diastolic face imaging. We prefer diastolic and a prospective imaging rather than a retrospective imaging. I'm aware that the audience may be quite varied, but the time doesn't quite allow him to go to the technicalities of CT, but this is what we are able to achieve in the RR interval in the diastolic phase. So CT has evolved significantly because of temporal resolution and um, like the, um, the ever envious scanner, the NHSL with quite a wide uh, CT slice, you'll be able to obtain these images with a single heartbeat. I don't have that. Um, so 
ultimately we are trying to obtain images like this, which is RC in the first image and the middle panel showing the LAD and the third panel showing both LAD and the circumflex and the left main stem. So another thing which we could do if you acquire the images in a retrospective phase involving both diastolic and systolic images, you'll be able to acquire image in CINI. Of course, because we have cardiac MR, we try not to do this unless the patient have contraindications to undergo um, CMR. We try not to get these images. This is a patient who had a history of tetralogy of fallow with a pacemaker in the RA lead. Um, so the, the RA lead was put in about 12 years ago and it's not MR compatible. So we had ended up doing a CT for this patient. So another huge advantage of CT is the fact that you'll be able to manipulate the image and acquire and guide the C arm fluoroscopy view from the CT as well. So this is where I'm talking about having a cross uh, con um, collaborative work with your colleagues, or interventional colleagues and radiologists sit together and discuss the complicated cases, which we do every week, twice a week um, in MDTs. So the strength of CTCA, this is a um, volume rendered images showing the proximal LAD stenosis. And of course, this is the representative catheter and geography images showing the same lesion and a same lesion showing in a slightly different view, but concentrate on the CT images showing the soft plaque with quite severe narrowing of the lesion. But of course, what did CT offer, which is different to the catheter angiography? But if you concentrate on the second highlighted point, just to proximal LAD, which most sinister, this patient would conventionally go for a, a PCI with um, um, PCI not even um, pressure-wise rest required because it's quite a significant narrowing. They would have conventionally had a stenting, but what, what they would lose out because the catheter angiography is a luminogram is the detail of looking at risk plaques. So yes, of course, we all picked up the mid LAD or um, prior to the diagonal LAD lesion, but what is important is patient might have a PCI, but we might lose out the more vulnerable plaque much proximally at risk, which is highlighted with these yellow dots, which is the with spotty calcification, lot of soft plaques, the patient might come back again with a massive proximal LAD in graft, even after stent placement. So this is the advantage of having a roadmap for either uh, interventional colleagues or the surgeons with the CTA not only picked up the fact that a lesion which is can be seen by a catheter, but there are other lesions which can be more high risk to intervene. So this is a decision had to be made based on an MDT discussion whether we should stent an aggressive treatment or should we send this patient to surgeons or should we place the stent involving the more proximal LAD. So guidelines, Yes, guidelines are guidelines, but it's important to remember the strength of CT and the sensitivity and negative predictive value. The technical aspects of CT is constantly evolving. Spatial resolution are improving and we'll be able to analyze instant stenosis, um, which is difficult in most um, CT scanners, but the high end top end imaging with good heart rate control will be able to review instant stenosis as well. Another lot of interest from CT side is how are we able to review a plaque? Yes, intravascular ultrasound, IVUS, which is used by interventional colleagues, are able to analyze soft plaque characteristics, but the CT allows you to analyze soft plaques in a much more grand scale of all vessel territories. So pay attention to this image. The interest is in the necrotic core which are vulnerable plaques, how do we analyze? Imaging opens up another view. We've done, we were involved in this research just to show not all plaques are vulnerable. Some plaques are dormant, which is remained with heavy calcification, but some plaques are very vulnerable. So this is a, a sodium a PET scan, which highlights um, um, some of the vulnerable plaques to review um, at-risk plaques not all plaques rupture. 
this is another criticism for CT. CT tend to overcall lesions. Yes, that's true, but that happens if you have a quite an extensive amount of calcium load at the plaque, or if you have rhythm irregularities, or you have an overtly obese patient on the scanner, or uh, some technical irregularities, particularly uh, breathing is one of the things which we talk about. So pseudo um, positive lesions are there, but that's worth discussing. And that's one of the limitations of CT we need to think about. But overall outcomes are good. Uh, how do we standardize reporting? But we need to use something called CADRATS, which is highlighted here, which is again widely available. Um, and I've shared this with some of my colleagues here. How do we report coronary artery disease? Um, because after a CTA, we'll be able to either discharge or send it to intervention. And there is another group that we don't know what to do. So moderate lesions will require another form of image. So based on CADRAD reporting standards, we'll be able to offer another test. But overall cost effectiveness with CT is much, much better. Of course, in any form of imaging, it's very difficult to match coronary artery disease does the patient have actual ischemia or the patient has angina or not? It's not a perfect um, issue. So there is a dilemma in all form of imaging. There is the perfect match of coronary artery stenosis and symptomatology is going to be a problem. But that's available globally in all modalities. But if you look at and put all imaging into panel, um, CT comes high at the top in terms of discharging patient and road mapping diseases. Another tool which CT offers is the fractional flow reserve. Conventionally, as you know, if you have a lesion, intervention colleagues would pace, uh, put pressure wire and analyze your FFR, which is the fractional flow reserve, and then decide does this patient require stent or not? Now we'll be able to do, we tend to do this on CT. We send these images to a um, Californian based company called HeartFlow, which is a very expensive tool, but you could send the images at the drop of a button. We send the images. So if we identify moderate lesions, because we our reports are read by nurses and discharge patients back to home. So we need to give a cast iron guarantee. Does this patient require aggressive management? Does this patient require coming back to the hospital in three months? So we tend to do heart flow analysis, which gives an element of functional study to already an anatomical descriptor where this patient had a um, um, LAD lesion, which is highlighted in R, and we'll be able to give it a FFRCT, which is a amazingly interesting tool and it's rapidly evolving. So this example, just to show you this proximal LAD calcified plaque, which is causing severe luminal narrowing, but we were able to um, not really exclude and discharge the patient because of the limitations of blooming artifact, which you see with calcium in um, with overcalling, which we call pseudo um, stenosis. So we send this data into heart flow. And as you can see, it remained a pale blue to yellow LAD flow all the way down. So that's not a significant lesion. And we were able to send the patients with aspirin and statin back to the community. So the key is to reduce unnecessary intervention on the patient, unnecessary uh, PCI. So this is just to highlight um, advantages on both panels. The lesions look significant. The RCA lesions on the bottom panel here, proximal. On visual, it looks severe, but on FFR, as you can see, the flow across is acceptable. And it is um, confirmed on a, a conventional P FFR as well, this lesion not to be significant, and this patient was followed up and is very well published in the de facto trial. So um, these lesions both look very similar, but the FFR which comes on these things are different. So CT, FFR, CT gives this amazing ability, not only anatomical, but element of functional data. The advantage of FFR, CT is it reduces unnecessary intervention. Patient going into catheter after a CT, does it require? So another development just to show you is the 
cardiac CT perfusion. There is a lot of interest in iodine mapping, looking at the myocardium, uh, looking at if there is any areas of segmental hypoperfusion, are we able to do stress and rest on CT? Are we able to pay, say, or based on CT, has the patient have, have had previous infarcts? Yes, we'll be able to say there is hyperemia, there is evidence of established infarct. If you have fat deposition of old infarcts, then can be seen. So the, um, the discipline is evolving as we speak. Um, and we use this at, at a clinical level as well. Want to highlight one more image. So this is a patient who um, uh, pre-surgical planning for a polyp had a CT. Have a look at this is CT scan with bilateral pleural effusion, CT showing something in the mediastinum and another imaging showing something in the mediastinum as well. So 10 days later, patient comes to A&E with rip roaring pulmonary edema and this patient's preoperative chest X-ray was this and this was the one which is done at A&E. But what we have failed to identify is from our side, because at, our, at the time of heart failure, they thought it's ACS, patient went on to have a catheter, LAD, RC was negative, but the, from the radiology side, we have failed to identify not only coronary artery calcification, but most importantly, aortic valve calcification. If we are going to change anything in the community, we don't need to have gated scans in certain populations. So this is a one carry home message. Point out coronary artery calcification based on what you see on all CTs. That actually makes a difference into the community. Yes, not all patients require aggressive management, but at least risk modification is a key to deal with cardiovascular disease. Otherwise, we are not going to win this battle because cardiovascular disease goes hand in hand with lifestyle modification. And the other thing which we have to change is, are we going to reduce mortality? Um, Aortic valve stenosis with collapse and death rates are higher than small cell cancer in a six month period in UK. I'm not sure the figures here, but if you see severe aortic valve calcification, it's imperative that we recommend an echocardiogram because the patient can have a significant mortality if we miss that six months or 12 month gap by us not pointing out the fact that patients have aortic calcification. This is very well documented with the work we've done with the BSCCT and BSDI. How do we report incidental calcium in all form of cardiac imaging? Aortic valve out of all of these, probably the more important thing that we need to highlight. We've, we've done some work with the lung cancer screening, which we've done in Manchester, again, highlighting the improved cardiovascular diseases, even in people who have lung cancer. Augustine's score um, is a bread and butter of CT, um, gated imaging, but Augustine's score doesn't stop us doing CT angiogram. Augustine's score doesn't stop because this is an example where this patient had zero Augustine's score. And when we did the CT angiogram showed a very proximal critical stenosis, both seen on the CT angio and the volume vented images. So we don't stop imaging based on calcium score. What calcium score is helpful is if you have severe calcium scoring, we tend to stop doing the CTCE. Another group where really gaining momentum is the aortic valve disease because you can actually do um, transcatheter aortic valve implantation. I've heard there is some interest in Sri Lanka. So uh, shout out for interest people. I'm happy to do a, another talk on these things because 60% of our workload with non-coronary artery disease related to a pre tavi planning. Some people call TAVI, which is American. Again, very standardized reporting. At the moment, aortic valve replacement is offered only to um, low to moderate risk patients and offer into severe disease, it tends to be catheter, but there is a lot of evidence gaining. All form of aortic valve replacement has a better survival when it comes to transcatheter. So one example here, just to show a few examples, I don't know whether you picked up, this is a retrospective scan of a patient showing a 
anomalous coronary artery coming with chest pain. Left main stem have a different origin, and you could see it's impinging between the aortic root and the main pulmonary artery. That was the cause. So this patient was directly sent to cardiac surgeons. So this is an example of an echocardiogram picked up a little of a LVH and they thought there was a bit of hokum and we wanted to distinguish after a cardiac MR, the patient had coronary artery disease. Of course, when we did the coronary CT, we picked up a patient had a single coronary artery um, that was the main cause for left ventricular hypertrophy and there was no left main stem. This patient again went into cardiac surgeon's attention. So these are some of the other examples. Um, just the preamble to put this talk, because there is a lot of evidence to say CTCA is good in managing acute chest pain, not just stable angina. There is interest. So there will be a time, certainly it has come in UK, we have to offer CTCA to all forms of acute chest pain as well in either a double rule out or triple rule out. But this, this slide is actually very old. When I did my fellowship, this was a slide, and this is true even to this state, there is a lot of interest in ACS because the equipment is good, selection of patients are good, and we'll be able to give a cast time guarantee if the CTCA is negative. So good evidence, and I think we should promote it because we'll be able to uh, gatekeep most of the diseases. So the Evidence for CT is overwhelming, whether it's revascularization or coronary artery disease, but the key is from the NICE guidelines have shown over and over again, it's cost effective and it's beneficial. So I won't spend too much on the triple rule out uh, with the interest of time and I think Booth will talk about it, but I would want to talk about CTCA is gaining a lot of popularity, but unfortunately, total dose of radiation is something which we need to talk about. Therefore, clinical governance and opening up CTCA to all comers is a problem. So there has to be gatekeeping and clinical governance. That would be my summary, but, but one thing we need to do is not forget the patient. The, um, the um, explode, there is an explosion of knowledge we all have when it comes to medicine, but what we do historically and even to this day work in silos, we don't work as a team, but we've now realized that model is not working, but ultimately one who suffers is actually the patient. So I think working together as a team can take us a long way. I would like to end this talk just to remember uh, there is a patient behind all this and just remember symptom-based management is something of the past but the CTA strength is improving it's going up and it's undoubtable thank you thank you Dr. Devinda Karnaratna uh, the lecture is open for um, one or two questions uh, if the audience have got any questions I've gone three minutes over. Yes. Um, yeah, that's where the criticism is actually offering CTCA for asymptomatic people um, is again a much debated point and we all would discourage. There are of course a lot of um, clinicians who have access to CTA uh, might end up having CTAs through contact. Or uh, in US, the private sector is opening up CTCA in a very wholesale model. That's again, time and time proven. It's a very high risk model that we shouldn't encourage. If there is no asymptom the asymptomatic patient shouldn't have any intervention because what do we do with the lesion that we pick up if the patient is asymptomatic? Because Yes, if at all, offering a calcium score would be good, yes, but if the risk model has to be analyzed prior to CTA. So I think gatekeeping is an absolute must. Opening to all comers is an absolute no-no because ultimately patients suffer. It's almost having a 
MR brain for the sake of it, because there is implications in UK for insurance. If they pick up coronary artery disease, they'll be uh, their premium goes up. If they pick up a, um, um, I don't know, white matter lesion, which has no consequences in an MR brain, that has implications. So I think imaging hats is risks. So I think vomit is the BMJ RSA may drive that we say we need gatekeepers, we need collaborative work to keep imaging after an assessment rather than asymptomatic all comers. Unless it's done as a research model or a screening. Yes, there is a interest, I think, uh, from a couple of military hospitals in Southeast Asia where they have done some research on asymptomatic soldiers um, to see their fitness and to do their assessment. So there is a case for that from a research point of view, but then I think we need to match the benefit to the patient as well, therefore. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Devinda Karnaratna, giving that, that very informative lecture. Since we are, uh, the time is, uh, uh, limited, uh, we will uh, switch over to the next lec lecture. Uh, let me introduce, and it's a great pleasure to introduce one of my fellow radiologists, is any, uh, Dr. Buddhi Niroshana Abevikrama. He's a consultant interventional radiologist at Sri Jayavardhanapura General Hospital. He graduated uh, from the University of Colombo in 2002 and had his MD radiology from the PGIM of Sri Lanka. And he had his fellowship training in thoracic and cardiac imaging at Royal Perth Hospital, Western Australia. He has given a number of lectures and a wide variety of topics. Uh, and his favorite subject being cardiac imaging. Over to you, Dr. Buddhi. Yeah, thank you very much. Good, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I should thank us to the SLMA and the Sri Lanka College of Radiologists to give me this opportunity. And I should thank Dr. Devinda Karunaratna for uh, delivering a wonderful lecture on the cardiac CT. And he has actually uh, covered some of my uh, slides as well. So I, will, I can go through the, them quickly. So what is cardiac CT? So I will simplify, simplify some of the things for the trainees who are joining the session. So the cardiac CT is a usual CT, but should have a, at least 64 slice or detector rows. Usually we are talking about slices, so it should be more than 64 slices. And we should have a ECG gating for the acquisition of the data. And we should have a, a reconstructing software. Uh, what is the rationale of doing a cardiac CT in ED setup? Actually, I'm talking about the uh, ED setup uh, in chest pain. So the one of the most frequent presentations to ED is acute chest pain. Acute chest pain is the in the ED is one of the overwhelming healthcare challenges. So no one knows whether this is cardiac or can we discharge him? Can should I send him to? Uh, medical ward, so there are some problems uh, within the clinicians. So most patients with acute chest pain do not have life-threatening underlying condition. So those people should be able to discharge home from the ED if there is no significant pathology. And the large number of patients unnecessarily admitted for observation. And that will uh, be difficult, that uh, the patient will face difficulties by admitting for one or two days. So clinically significant conditions cannot be misdiagnosed and discharged from ED. So if there is something significant, it should not go undiagnosed. If there are facilities for cardiac CT for ED patients, management protocol will, would be different from the usual management we are offering now. And then when the patient presents with uh, uh, acute chest pain, there should be a basic assessment at the ED. We'll take the history, including the age, previous 
coronary artery disease, CV angina, aspirin intake, family history, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, and smoking. And then the patient will undergo examination and then some investigation like ECG, whether there are ST changes. And then sometimes a uh, patient will go for chest X-ray and then uh, cardiac biomarkers like troponin. Then with these things, then the ED clinician the, should uh, think of whether the patient needs cardiac CT. So this is an uh, example of guideline from NICE guideline in 2020, uh, assessing the diagnosis suspected stable angina patient. So it, in this, it clearly demonstrates that under the investigations, uh, it has become a 64 size CT coronary angiogram as a first line investigation to diagnose. So whom to be excluded from cardiac CT? If, if the patient comes with clear evidence of acute coronary syndrome, that means patient has either with a, a typical chest pain, ECG changes, troponin positive. So those patients, or oh, patient with uh, ECG changes and typical angina. So those patients should promptly treated by a cardiologist or the ED physicians with medicine and maybe invasive coronary angiogram and intervention. So what are the traditional imaging methods we have to offer at the ED are chest X-ray, echo. So those will be usually normal in this setup. Do we have evidence to suggest whether this CT, uh, cardiac CT is important at ED? Yes, there are several studies. Actually, Dr. Devin has showed a lot of uh, studies saying that uh, CT is most comprehensive technique for the non-invasive evaluation of the cardiac structures in patients presenting with acute chest pain at the emergency room. And several observational studies have evaluated the utility of double rule out or triple rule out protocols for assessing aortic, pulmonary, or cardiac sources of chest pain in the same examination. So these are some of the studies that showing the specificity, uh, sensitivity, and the negative predictive value, which are good and showing safety and the effectiveness, uh, efficiency of the cardiac CT in ED setup. American College of Cardiology, and BJR, so they published several uh, articles on the importance of uh, cardiac CT. So the conclusion of these studies have been safe and efficient in uh, triaging patients at ED. So high sensitivity and specificity with good negative predictive value. And it facilitates discharge from ED and lower the cost by reducing hospital stay, reduce inconvenience to patients, and misuse and overuse has to be considered. Uh, and I will talk how to establish and implement imaging protocol at ED. So the, it is a multidisciplinary collaboration and strategic planning as Dr. Devinder said. So it usually involves radiologist and ED physician, and the patient should have, uh, there should be a method of thorough assessment of the patient at the ED, then decision to refer to cardiologist or to perform cardiac CT has to be decided by the ED physician. Uh, as I said before, if the patient is having the typical angina with uh, the ECG troponin changes, then patient should be uh, treated promptly or else patient should be transferred to cardiology unit. And uh, then if the decision is taken to do the cardiac CT, then the patient should be prepared to cardiac CT. Uh, that will include uh, doing serum creatinine levels and uh, uh, we'll have to uh, control the heart rate, like things. So then we have to adjust the technical protocols to reduce radiation dose, as well as IV contrast dose and to obtain satisfactory images, not the best quality images, but to get the satisfactory images to diagnose the arterial disease. And a supervising radiologist or a fellow to be present at the time of the scan is mandatory. And modification of technique, depending on the clinical scenario has to be decided, like uh, triple rule out or double rule out or single rule out. 
so early reporting and verbal communication is also very important so what are the conditions that make ctc a difficult or maybe not applicable are if the patient is very obese or un uncooperative if the patient can't breath hold then it is no point of doing a cardiac ct with the motion artifact and uh, if the patient bmi is very high like 40 and very obese patient will not have a satisfactory quality images and high levels of coronary calcium like uh, if the calcium score is more than 800 and some ct scanners won't give a good diagnostic quality images and if the patient has arrhythmia, so uncontrollable heart rate, again, will be difficult. And poor renal function and contrast reactions, uh, another uh, difficulty. And pregnancy, we, were, we would not uh, uh, expose the patient for radiation and contrast media allergies also. And we have to think of Card, uh, radiation dose when we are doing a CT study. As I said before, it should not be the best quality image, but should be the satisfactory quality image to diagnose the disease. So we, the, depending on the patient's BMI and the heart rate and the area of coverage and the technique used will determine the radiation dose. So if the heart rate is high, then we'll have to go for a retrospective gate in cardiac CT in that the uh, radian dose, radiation dose will be very high. And, uh, and the coverage of examination, if, the, if we are doing only the heart, then the radiation dose will be less than if we are uh, covering our entire chest to rule out the triple rule out or double rule out. And uh, technique wise, we have two techniques. One is prospective gating, another one is retrospective gating. Prospective gating uh, CT uh, chest, uh, cardiac CT will give a least uh, radiation dose, maybe even 0.7 millisieverts. That is very far less uh, uh, annual radiation dose for the patient. Uh, and retrospective gating has two methods one is uh, with ECG modulation, and the one is Without ECG, uh, without ECG modulation, the ECG modulation means we uh, give the full current, full exposure at a, only at a one phase, uh, one uh, phase of the cardiac cycle. But in the unmodulated study, we will uh, entire cardiac cycle will be exposed with uh, high current. So it is mandated to supervise the study by a imaging specialist. So these are the images we are getting in. So it can be the 3D volume rendered image like in this, and then we have the MIP images that is maximum intensity project projection that will show the uh, arteries. And then we have curved planar reconstruction that is uh, a software in the machine that will uh, straighten the vessel and uh, can measure the length and can measure the uh, lumen stenosis area. And there are other things that we can diagnose in the uh, cardiac CT. Those are coronary anomalies. They found in, uh, incidentally in 0.3 to 1% of health, healthy individuals. And uh, coronary anomalies can be anomalies of the origin or anomalies of course, anomalies of the termination. And anomalies of origin are the, these are two anomalies of origin. One is uh, the origin of the RCA in the uh, left coronary sinus, as Dr. Devinder said. And other one is uh, l -kappa, that is uh, anomalous left coronary artery from pulmonary artery. Or there are other uh, anomalous origins like uh, LAD coming from the pulmonary artery or maybe the right coronary coming from the uh, pulmonary artery. So those are the anomalies of the origin. And anomalies of course is one example is uh, uh, myocardial bridge. That is a part of the artery going through the myocardial if the if the myocardial bridge is thick, if the artery is deep in the myocardium, then the patient can have some symptoms with uh, exercise. So sometimes the people might need uh, beta blockers to control the heart rate, then the uh, diastolic blood flow will increase. And the anomalies of termination would be like fistulas, 
And are they significant? Yes, some of them are significant and can have acute uh, cardiac deaths. Uh, regarding the triple rule out, it's a, a technical uh, technical change of the study. Uh, instead of giving a, in usual coronary CT, what we do is we give contrast and uh, give a bolus of uh, saline to empty the right heart from the contrast to exclude any streaky artifacts from the right heart. And but in the triple rule out study, what we will do is we will continue contrast uh, column with a diluted contrast. So the pulmonary artery system also will be enhanced. So we have coronary arteries, aorta, and the pulmonary uh, artery system enhanced with the contrast. So we can exclude uh, coronary arterial disease, aortic disease, and as well as pulmonary embolism. And we can assess the bypass graft also. If the patient comes with the chest pain with the who has had a bypass, then we can assess the bypass graft. And also we can assess the stents. And as Dr. Devinda showed that the function can be assessed. And the myocardial perfusion, he described that as well. And some of the pathologies that we'll encounter in the acute setup are, one is uh, uh, intimal flaps like uh, aortic dissections. Uh, so some, some of these dissection flaps can go into the coronary arteries and can uh, stenose the coronary arteries as well. So those things can be diagnosed. We can uh, diagnose uh, intramural thrombi in the aorta and uh, ulcerated plaques, like in this, in this case, there's a ascending aortic uh, ulcerated plaque with a small hematoma around. So we also, we can identify pericarditis. There is enhancing pericardium with pericardial thickening uh, and some fluid within it. So uh, it can be the TB pericarditis or viral pericarditis. So this is uh, pulmonary embolism. You can see in the both lungs there are pulmonary emboli and also uh, the chest pain could be due to mediastinitis in this image we can see that mediastinum is thickened and with that standing showing the edema of the mediastinum the mediastinal uh, mediastinitis but there are no abscesses there is so this patient might not need any uh, interventions for and then we can assess the valves and chambers. This patient was patient, it's the aortic uh, uh, calcification and the cusp thickening with a very small uh, uh, lumen in the aortic, uh, between the aortic cusps. And the upper third row is showing a diverticulum in the septum with, due to small rupture. And the last row shows some thrombi within the atrial appendages and the uh, so those things also can be diagnosed. And there are plural pathologies that can be uh, diagnosed in the acute chest pain uh, if we do a cardiac CT. So those may be uh, maybe lung masses, pleural effusions, metastasis in the ribs or the uh, thoracic spine. So this is another example of a mass in the lung with a pleuritic chest pain. This is a breast mass in the second image. So in the conclusion, I would like to highlight some of these things as cardiac CT has been identified internationally as a valuable investigation for acute chest pain presenting to ED. And proper protocolic and understanding to be formulated at institutional level. Request and studies should be supervised by an imaging specialist. And misuse and overuse of the cardiac CT should be overseen to avoid unnecessary radiation and wastage of the resources. And the radiologists should take the responsibility as their duty to make these facilities available at their institutions to par with the international standard of care. Thank you very much. Good day. Uh, now this is open for the questions. Uh, 
there are no questions in the chat box. Are there any questions from the audience? How much is the radiation dose for a normal uh, cardiac CT? Cardiac actually that depends on the size of the patient. Uh, the lowest radiation dose I have given to a patient is 0.7 millisievert. So that is uh, around uh, four months of background radiation. That depends and how on the chest X-rays. Maybe around Seven, 100, right? 100. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, because if the patient is very thin, he can use maybe 70 kV P study. Usually we give 100 kV for average build patient. And if we, sometimes if the patient is obese, we'll have to use 130 kV. So in that case, it might go up to 16 or 20 millisieverts. So that that is very, uh, very much radiation dose. But again, other thing is the uh, heart rate Depending on the heart rate, also the radiation dose uh, changes. Because if the heart rate is very low, like 60, then we can do a prospective gating study and uh, we can finish it with very low radiation. But if the heart rate is not uh, controlled, then again, it will go to at least 12 millisieverts kind of range. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Buddhi because uh, the CTs that we have done. Uh, in the recent past uh, at NHSL all have been less than uh, uh, eight millisieverts, even for the very obese patients. And most of them about one or two. Another thing is I want to highlight is uh, some people say that we have to give a very large dose of contrast, but it is not true again. If, uh, if we do a 80 kV study, uh, we can manage the patient with even 35 ml of contrast. The lowest dose I have given is 28 ml. Yeah. Two questions. Um, what's the interest from the ED physician and coming on board with this method of imaging? And the other point is, uh, are you offering gating for dissection at any of the trusts? The thing yeah, uh, I think uh, in the ED setup, actually, I don't have experience because I haven't worked at a government setup in the uh, kind of a good machine, which can be, uh, which a CT scan can be done. So Dr. Uh, Janaka will uh, explain it. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for, uh, for asking that question. We had a, that, that was the first patient that we had uh, very recently, uh, that was aortic dissection. We did it uh, gator. And then there was one uh, uh, study uh, that is for a tumor of the heart, uh, and it was a mixoma that was missed in uh, uh, two or three places outside, uh, I mean, performed outside Colombo, I mean, with normal CTs. And uh, we, after gating, we could uh, diagnose it very well. That was done last week. And is there good interest from the physicians in order yeah. to set up this? Uh, yes, in the future, we hope that uh, the, they will uh, uh, send patients and then they will send the patients to us. Yes. Yeah, one unfortunate thing is the CT scanners in our hospitals are very busy. So it will be a, a quite a difficult task for us to accommodate all these uh, ED cases in acute chest pain to the CT scan because the routine CT scans we can't accommodate even sometimes there are waiting lists for two, two three months for the CT scans. So, but uh, we should have a kind of a, uh, protocol that uh, maybe even we should have a two CT scanners, one for the uh, CT, uh, cardiac CTs and maybe another one for the other things. So there should be a, a discussion with the ministry level to get those equipment. Uh, one last question and excellent lectures from both lecturers. I just want to ask you, Buddhi, and the panel also. Now, you showed a wide spectrum of diseases in cardiac CTs. So, it is going to be a challenge for the radiologists and the service providers 
to look at them in the emergency setting, isn't it? How do you sort of propose to do this? Because it will be very difficult once you start doing it for chest pain patients with adult patients not to offer the seat. Then you can't be looking at it next day morning or next day evening. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be a yeah. big challenge. Isn't it? Uh, it, of course, it is a challenge because if we start, and I, I think actually if we provide the cardiac CT, it, it should be able to provide the acute setup as well. If we keep the patient for one week and two weeks, and uh, if we do the cardiac CD, it's no point, I think. That will be good for the some of the things to be assessed, but not for the chest pain assessment. So if we provide this facility, then we should be able to uh, have a kind of a good uh, system, uh, maybe like in the stroke protocols. So we should uh, have a very good uh, dedicated team for that. So uh, at least uh, fellow radiologists should be available Maybe we can actually, we can do the seat, cardiac CTs from maybe from 8 a.m. to at least 8 p.m. So um, in between, we can observe the patient as what we, what we do in the routine practice. But uh, if we provide the service maybe from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. with the registrars or the senior registrars cover, then that will be good. But the workload definitely will be very high. I mean, I mean, I agree with Buddhi and the team. Um, I think the two things is training. I think we just need to get the registrars and the fellows involved to identify what are the at-risk diseases. Even if we miss something on the first read, the following day when a consultant reads it and verifies and checks subtleties, you know, breast lesions and very unusual pericardial thickening or tumors, that's okay. But I think picking up a PE, a dissection, or proximal coronary artery disease is going to be, I think, bread and butter because, you know, proximal SMA, stenosis, renal artery thrombosis, or um, all those things are going to be part and parcel of registrar training. I think workforce planning and then have a second read to pick up all the other incident lomas are absolutely important. I think... Uh, Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Buddhi, and also Dr. Devinder Karnaratna for enlightening the audience on these CT coronary angiograms. And in fact, Dr. Devinder Karnaratna, you stressed on the importance of quality, so which I also appreciate quite a lot. And then, and also thank you very much. Uh, for the SLMA for arranging this uh, on behalf of the College of Radiology. So that concludes our presentations. Thank you. <laughs>